What's going on, nerds? Welcome back to another very, very special episode of the Comic Book Nerd Nation. Uh, let's jump right into it. I'm Fox Two. I'm here today with the whole F and Brian. Hello. The pirate. Hey guys. And Topher. Welcome back, everybody. And an extremely special guest. Uh, it is an absolute honor to be able to welcome him as a guest on the podcast this week. Um, I, there's nothing that hasn't been said that I could say about him. He is an absolute legend in the comic book world, Mr. Neil Adams. Well, how are you, Kevin? <laughs> oh. <laughs> was, it that cl- was it that close to Kevin Smith's intro? I mean, I think his was maybe a little bit, uh, he, was, he was a little bit more into it than I was. But, uh, it's, 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 an absolute, it's an absolute honor to have you on here. It's and, a pleasure uh, to be here. Let, it, let us uh, kind of pick your brain a little bit. Oh, so, yeah. You can... Let's, uh, I've, got, I've got a question. I'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, oh, okay. It's it's pretty well-known fact that you were essentially the agent of change in the comic book industry uh, earlier in your career, um, you know, for many different aspects as far as uh, comic book artists' rights um, to, like, their original works, as well as um, helping the original creators of Superman get credit for the character what was i mean what was that like you know what was uh it was like uh living among neanderthals (laughs) 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 i moved into the cave next door and i turned i went what the hell is with you people i do not understand i want to be here and i want to draw your comic books for a while but you know what i may leave soon unless you guys straighten up and fly right because you guys are really you have no idea the rest of the world out there Now, there was a reason they didn't have any idea what the rest of the world was like, and that was because in 1953, the Congress had attacked comic books. They, you know, they finished with communists, and they opened their dictionary, and they found, you know, comic books, you know, because of legislation by uh, by dictionary, (laughs) And, uh, and they decided to attack comic books because that's what made juvenile delinquents and made horny teenagers who went out and raped people and did all kinds of terrible things. So uh, Congress attacked comic books, and comic books withdrew into its shelf like a, like a, uh, a lob, you know, crab into, into its, into its uh, shell, and, and they basically uh, stopped time. <laughs> From 1953 to 1963, they did nothing. They had, they had a comics code, there, and they did, rights meant nothing. <clears throat> Original art were that guys used to steal out of the drawers. They would leave in the drawers. And then they'd cut them up and throw them away. Uh, there was no such thing as rights. Guys were not fighting for rights. They were fighting to survive. Uh, guys from All the guys from EC Comics went elsewhere. One of them, uh, I, I'm trying to think of his name, uh, Reed Crandall, became a security guard. Reed Crandall. Now, those of you who have studied enough of comic books, Reed Crandall, <laughs> good artist, security guard. Wally Wood was going around... Uh, uh, doing working for fantasy and science fiction, and whoever would hire him, Alex Toth went out to California to animate for Han and Barbera. George Evans, I don't know what the hell happened to him. I did catch up to him at one point in a, in a place I worked at, but those guys scattered to the four winds, and there was no work for them. DC Comics wouldn't hire them. Western, every once in a while, Western Publishing. Who the hell is Western Publishing? They didn't crap. <laughs> and a yard wide, and then they had. Then there was Dell, and they did crap in a yard wide. And they did just you know, comic books based on TV shows and stuff like that. So some people got work, but essentially it was you know, uh, the Pat Boone show. Essentially. So before you, there comics. was no like, there was no spokesperson for the industry or anything like that. There was there was guys quaking because they thought next week I'm never going to get any work again. I mean, the business, I went out, when I was a teenager, understand that I didn't start being, you know, uh, Captain Video. I started as, a, just like everybody else, as a teenager. I was 18 years old, and I was trying to make a living. So I went to DC Comics with my portfolio. It was a good portfolio. Yeah. And I tried to get in, and they said, uh, this old guy comes out, and he says, uh, kid, you know, forget it, because, you know, a year from now, there's not going to be any comic books. And I went to Archie Comics. They said the same thing. There, there were no comics. There were, it's, they were ready to go out of business. Wow. And they didn't 
what, what are they going to do? Are they going to fight for their rights while they're trying to survive and feed their kids? It was a terrible, terrible business. I had a, then a career kind of around the fringes of comic books. I did comic books for advertising. I did illustration work. I did uh, a comic strip, a syndicated strip. That was incredible for a kid my age. But then I came back to comic books, and I re-entered you know, a little bit later after I had this career. But I had been out in the world. I had worked for advertising agencies, for publishers, you know, where they had contracts and purchase orders. And you know, we work by the book. You, know, you read the contract. You decided to do it or not to do it or to change the contract. You'd negotiate. In comic books, it was shit for the birds. They had nothing, they had no contracts, they had no agreements, the artwork was cut up and thrown away or thrown into storage. Oh, that just hurts you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you just, yeah, it hurts you to think about it. Imagine seeing it in front of your eyes. Oh, I can't imagine wow. how, how mad you must have been. Angry? No, I was stunned, stunned. I was, a, I was up at DC Comics and I saw a guy in the corner cutting your pages. And it's like... Really? You can't, you can't, you're cutting up pages. You see nothing wrong with this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm the low man on the totem pole, I gotta do this shit. Uh, <laughs> whoa, really, really? Guys would come in and, and take stuff out of the drawers because that's the only way to rescue stuff, but nobody cared. <clears throat> Certain artists would actually rescue some of their work, but... It was it was it was everywhere. Nobody cared. You know, it didn't let, it wasn't like you take a photostat or scan something and send in the scan. You gave them the art, right. and once you gave it to them, you tried to get another job. That was it. So to come out of the syndicated strip business and to advertising and book publishing and stuff into this Neanderthal existence was ridiculous. You know, you, you, people say, oh, yeah, you were the revolutionary and you did all this stuff. No, no, no. I went into camp and I showed them how to make fire. <laughs> I mean, I they, were, they knew. <laughs> Led the they, way. Really, they knew nothing. I, when I saw the stuff, the artwork being cut up, I went to the guy and I said, D -d what are you doing? I'm cutting up the artwork. Well, no, 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 you can't cut up the artwork. <laughs> you can't cut up the artwork. Well, it's my lousy job. No, no, we don't want to do this. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go off, and I'm going to go and talk to somebody, and you stop cutting that stuff up, and I'll come back, and we'll do something else. He says, yeah, yeah, fine. So finally I said, okay, let's do it like this. You don't cut up any more artwork, or I'll punch you in the face really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Always oh. threatened with physical violence. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes. Hey, there's a place to go, way. you know. Oh. There's a place you got to go sometimes. Not, I don't think I would have hit him. Uh, maybe, I <laughs> but th I'm just saying, I didn't have to hit him because he backed away and went to, back to his desk. Right, right. And then I had to convince uh, Karma Infantino and the publisher to like not destroy the artwork, and I had to pr threaten to leave and never do any work for them, for them just to s stop destroying the artwork. That didn't stop them from uh. returning it. It took seven years to convince them to return the artwork. That's incredible. <clears throat> seven years. It's incredible to me that, that that it was that much of a that much of a fight to uh, just to get them to stop creating something that was well that was here's so here's a, so many people here's it, this is, it's even worse than that it's it's sort of like um uh, if you do if you invent a new invention and then you know, and everybody says you're crazy and then then the, it works and then everybody says oh this, of course that's the way it's supposed to be. Nowadays, everybody goes, oh, yeah, of course, that's the way it should be, right? Right, right? Of course, that's what everybody thought, right? No, no, nobody thought that. Nobody. They were in a quandary. They were like monkeys, you know, they were like, Neander as I said, Neanderthals standing around the fire. Shall we throw this in the fire? It might be valuable. <laughs> yes, throw it in the fire. We'll make heat. <laughs> no, not a good idea. Don't throw that in the fire. Throw that in the fire. This is not a good idea. How about if we have contracts? Contracts. What do you do with contracts? Yeah. It's an agreement between men. Oh. oh. <laughs> so they didn't do it. Going in when, they the didn't audience. do it. I wrote papers and sent them to everybody in the business saying, the thing that they put on the back of your check, that's not a contract. The fact that they tell you you can't cash that check at a bank unless you, you agree to the contract is meaningless. It, the bank isn't part of a contract. They're just part of 
cashing checks. Yeah, that's yeah, all they do. They, they don't. Give a shit. They're not a co-signer on a contract. It's wrong. So write on either cross it out that thing on the back of the check or write uh, uh, I disagree or you know I, I, I oppose this and then cash your check and that'll be fine. That's how we tried to get by. That's how oh, I'm telling the I'm telling the the end of those guys write on the, scribble that out on the back of your check and then cash the check. Can I do that? Will they still <laughs> cash the check? Yes, they will because it has nothing to do with them. If you th- if you have a stupid teller, take it to another teller. Then sooner or later, you'll find a smart teller, and they will cash your check. Are you sure? That's so wild. <laughs> oh. it's, uh, I know it's like living in twenty twenty, but man, that's good. that's just crazy. The problem is that when things change, then everybody then agrees that it's right now. Okay, and that doesn't necessarily mean it's right now. It just means that now everybody agrees that this is better than that. That that's it's sort of like science. Science is like that. You you go well. No, this is wrong. This is you know the, the sun goes around the earth. No, the no maybe the earth goes around the sun. No, no, the moon goes around the earth. The stars go around the earth. The sun goes around the earth. It's all the same. Just stay up at night and look at it. Yeah, but I, I somehow I don't think that that's how it works. Oh yeah, well that mankind thought that for fifteen hundred years. 1,500 years, all of mankind, your bright brother, your bright uncle, uh, philosophers, uh, pseudoscientists said, no, the sun goes around the earth. 1,500 years until somebody got a telescope and said, took that thing that kids were playing with and said, why don't we make a better one and look up into the sky? Oh, shit. Fig- figure this thing out a little bit. <laughs> yeah. It's like you have, you have should, quite, a way of wor- quite a way with words to uh, you know, bring it into perspective like that. I think, uh, Topher, I think you, you had a question for Mr. Adams. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, along with this whole creator's rights thing and, you know, telling everybody, hey, you know, making them question the uh, the processes that they've been just you know adhering to all along, and saying I, I think it's really hard for people to to ever say, hey, I might be doing this wrong. There might be another way of doing it. Um, you know, and when you uh, when you started freelancing with Marvel, um, even though you were already doing work for DC. I mean, like that—that that hadn't really been done before. I mean, were you were you just you know trying to get some more work, or were you saying, "Hey, I'm going to break down this wall. I'm going to make it you know acceptable for uh, for creators to to you know take their work with them wherever they want to go." Well, uh, the, the the question was not being able to take work with you wherever you wanted to go, but to take to take work with you without fear, and so that. It was the question because they would change their names. Like uh, I think uh, Gene Colan was Adam Austin, and uh, and um, Mike Esposito was another name. You know, they, everybody signed a different name. Uh, my goal at that time was to actually do some work for Marvel Comics because Jim Steranko, who I had sort of made fun of, I didn't really make fun of him. I just did a joke with him uh, where I put his name in the steam, and you have to hold the comic book from the bottom to look at it and say, hey, it says, hey, a Jim Steranko effect. So he liked that. Came over and vi- visited me in the production room at DC Comics and told me about the Marvel method. The Marvel method in those days, which we tend to forget now, was you draw the comic book, you figure out what the plot is, and you give it to Stan, he puts in the dialogue. Oh, you know, all this, all this mystery about how Stan worked with Jack Kirby, it's no mystery. The 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 what Jack did was he drew the comic books, gave them to Stan, and Stan put the words in. There's no question. I don't even and I don't even think Stan questions it. The problem was that Stan was doing oh uh, six comic books a week. That's like a comic book a day. Just to do those words took a lot of time. So he was grateful when somebody came in and who could do the story. I mean, if somebody came in and said, Stan, have you got a story for me? And Stan would go, Well, can you just make it up? Uh, no, I, I need a story. And they, oh, shit, i got to write a story. So somebody like Don Heck would, you know, need to get a story. Jim, Stran- Jim Steranko would come and go, no, I'll do the story the hell with this. And so Stan said, fine, go ahead, kid. And so uh, he was very happy to let the person do the, the story and the plotting, unless it just, just he screwed it up completely. But, you know, the guys who were intelligent and who could do a story. So I wanted to do that. 
uh, mm. and uh, go over to, to Marvel and do that. So I went to Marvel, and I talked to Stan. Stan said, you can have any book you want. I said, well, no, you don't mean that. I mean, you got guys on me. He said, no, 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 you, any book you want, you can do. I said, why are you saying that, Stan? It's a little crazy. You don't want to take a book away from somebody. He says, well, you know, the only book that the guys over here read from DC Comics is Dead Man. Which was your uh, book? Which is a book that I was at that time writing as well as drawing and inking. Wow. And editing, by the way, because they didn't have an editor. The editor was dying of cancer, so he wasn't there. Uh, Jack Miller, as it turns out. Anyway, so uh, I said, well, cool. So, okay, um, what's your worst-selling title? He said, uh, X-Men, we're going to cancel it in two issues. Oh, I said, well, wow. <laughs> I said, then I'd like to, I'd like to work on X-Men. He said, Neil, I don't think you heard me. Uh, <laughs> we're going to cancel X-Men in two issues. And I said, challenge not. accepted. Right. So I said, <laughs> that's, so probably you're not going to pay much attention to it. He said, no, we're not going to pay any attention to it. We're going to cancel it in two issues. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to do it for however long it lasts. He says, okay, I'll make a deal with you. You do X-Men, we cancel it, then you do a, an important book, a really significant book. I said, well, like what? He says, Avengers. I said, sounds like a good deal. Hmm. Okay. So I started to do the X-Men. and end, ended up doing like 10 issues, and then they canceled it. They canceled it because of bad sales. As it turns out, the sales actually got better at the end. But the reason that the sales weren't good is something that you guys might like to know that has to do with the history of comics. Just so you know, the history of comics is, let me use the, the I can use a technical expression. Can I use a technical yeah, expression? Sure, yeah. Fucking, really. fucking, fucking bullshit from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Total fucking bullshit. You know what I'm saying? It's just bullshit. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Back in the day, when I was a kid, the publishers and the distributors, there were like 410 distributors across the country, local distributors. There's a major distributor, the big distributor, and then 410 distributors across the country. So... Uh, the, they came up with this plan because uh, publishers didn't want the books that weren't sold returned because then they'd have to deal with them. They'd have to pay for them being returned. They'd have to get credit. They'd have to store them. Then they'd have to destroy them, stuff like that. They didn't want to do it. So what they agreed with the distributors w was that they would, <laughs> they would cut the titles off the top of the comic book Right, and they bundle them in, in rubber bands and send them back to the to the publisher, and that would identify that they didn't sell those books. Right? Mm -hmm. Sound like a plan? Wow. So far, right? It's I kind of a plan. That's that a plan. Yeah. From a business, plan. it makes, makes yeah. sense. Yeah, uh, chimps could come up with a better plan. Than that. <laughs> yeah, right. So anyway, so they did that. Now I'm a kid, right, and I'm going mm -hmm. to school, Mark Twain Junior High in Coney Island, and there's a toy store on the way. And in that toy store, and remember, toys, it wasn't Toys R Us, it was a toy store, because there weren't toy stores back in those days. Like, you know, well, you know, we have a toy store for Christmas, but then what do you do? So they sell other stuff, and they sell comic books. Right in the front of the store, they sell comic books with the tops, the title, trimmed off. Cut off okay. And you can buy them for three cents and four cents. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I bought them. And you have to go through them, because you don't want, you know, five pages trimmed off with the title, with the cover, so you want to be able to read it. So you'd have to go through them and get, you know, whatever that you could get. Now, clearly, this was going on across America. That These local distributors were trimming the titles off, and they were selling these books for, you know, 10 cents or 5 cents. Uh, 5 cents, 6 cents, right? And then the stores would sell them for, you know, well, they were probably selling them for 2 cents, actually, can I think of it. So they were, of course, that's not, that doesn't make them a lot of money. But it does prove the basic dishonesty of human beings, which is important for us to understand. So all across the country, all the distributors were selling comic books with the title trimmed off. The companies, for whatever reason, didn't actually go out into the world among humans and see this. Because they were tired of getting these rubber bands with these titles, and they came up with a better plan. The better plan was called Affidavit Returns. I will sign a piece of paper that tells you I have destroyed 500 comic books. Uh, so and you, 
<laughs> the honor system, because <laughs> the, because the distributors had just proven that they were honest, right? Because that's going to work. Because <laughs> that's going to work. So we have the affidavit return system. Affidavit return system says, hey, I destroyed these comic books. Now they have full comic books with the titles on them. Also known as 75% off of price. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen? Now let me see what's going to happen. Teenagers in their dad's station wagons are going to drive up to the back of the distributor, going to go into the steps, and they're going to see a table at the back of their local distributor. And on the table are going to be Playboy magazines and comic books. Right? And they're going to go and buy comic books for seven cents a piece or five cents a piece or whatever it is. They're going to take those comic books and they're going to go to the local motel on Saturday or their garage or someplace, their living room. And the living room is not so smart. And they're going to sell those comic books for two bucks, five bucks, or whatever. Now, they can't sell uh, Superman's uh, girlfriend, Lois Lane or Jimmy Olsen comics for two bucks. But they can sell anything drawn by Jim Sterenko or Barry Smith or Bernie Wrightson or Neil Adams for two bucks and five bucks. And right? this was common practice. Uh, common practice. Like I told everybody you. Everybody knew about it listen, except for the industry. Listen, except for the industry, sure. <laughs> there were 410 <laughs> distrib local distributors around the country. Who would not do it? Yeah, I mean, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay, now. Okay to do it, basically. Yeah, they were they were practically inviting them yeah. to do it. Okay, so now let me ask you a question. When the direct sales market was created, and a given number of young entrepreneurs open up comic book stores, where did those guys come from? They're the kids that were buying shit for. Ha ha! Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Why could they buy direct without giving without there being any returns? Because they knew their market better than anybody. Oh, wow. It was a no return market. Oh, that's so crazy! Wow. I had no idea that that was how it. How you know how it all those out. all those old you know guys with the. Uh, ponytails and the old wrinkled faces now who are those old guys who are like who now are got, have gotten old and they still are running the business direct sales market guys bud plant and all those guys i'm not saying bud plant in particular i'm just saying all those guys that's how they started their business wow that's wild that's that's Crazy. so now let me ask you a question why didn't my x-men sell really great I, Why did, because yeah. they were buying it for half price. Yeah, they knew they could get right. it for yeah. nothing at the back of the Okay, so why do I go to conventions and I get mint condition copies of every book I ever did? Because oh guys have boxes of Because they buy 15, oh 20 man. copies of it for nothing. Right. Right, exactly. Oh, for that's nothing. Like, that's absolutely crazy. Now that's the that's the same ten run that you did with with uh, Magneto had the machine turning the humans to uh, to right. uh, mutants. Oh, it's wow. funny that funny how that seems to be the plot of the first X Men movie. Exactly, I was getting yeah. ready to say too. I, that's, Isn't that yeah. interesting? Good lead, Isn't that interesting? Good lead into Pirates question. You should have you should have seen Marvel come up to me with that royalty check to give to me because they used that as the plot of their first movie. Ha ha ha. Wow. <laughs> and what about Ra's al Ghul with Batman Origins? No, Ra Ra's al Ghul a little different. I guess, I guess DC Comics uh, learned their lesson. DC Comics, or Paul Levitz, who was the then publisher, came to my studio on 39th Street here and handed me a check for $100,000 wow. without a contract. Oh, wow. Without a contract. So that's what Ra's al Ghul costs. Well, no, because I got movie. another one on the third movie. <laughs> and I'm going to get other royalties based on that because the companies are starting to grow up. Not Marvel's not growing up as fast as DC Comics, I have to tell you. They are re really slow in the uptake. DC seems to be a little bit more like acting like adults. Uh, they are writing contracts. They're giving percentages. They're giving It doesn't cost them very much. I mean, you know, the percentages they give out are so small compared to the money they make. Well, if they haven't but, been giving anything in the past, anything yeah. they do give, the, the artists and stuff are going to be like, wow, this is great, you know? <laughs> it's funny how you can talk people into things like that. Wow. I wonder <laughs> how that happened. That's, mm -hmm. that's incredible. Who the hell did that? Hmm. It's, it's good, though, that they're 
finally starting to recognize that and, and you know get the artists some credit for, well, you know, for all the work they've done. Let me tell you some. Uh, let me tell you a story. <laughs> <laughs> I got a story to tell you, boys. Go for it. Conversation, okay, with lawyers and publishers all together in a room, and Neil's lawyers, they're talking to oh, Neil. And, and well, I, mean, I like to talk to lawyers. They're, <laughs> they're, they're, they know their stuff, and that's all they know. So anyway, so I'm talking to them, and uh, and uh, I say, look, you guys, you guys are publishing books. You should be giving royalties when the books make money. No, no, we're not publishing books. We're publishing periodicals. They're magazines. They're comic books. No, no, excuse me. You're publishing books. You call them comic books. They are books. No, no, they're periodicals. No, no, excuse me. Let's try to understand ourselves here. I work for a lot of book publishers. You have to put bu- books out periodically. Otherwise, you're not going to be in business. You can't just say that you're you know, going to put out a book here and a book there. You have to have a, what you call a flow of income. Okay, So you put out books, really put them out monthly. Only you do it differently. You have what you call periodicals, but they're not. They're books that you put out monthly. Well, you may think that, Mr. Adams, but we don't think that. We think we're putting out magazines, periodicals. Hold on a second. You say you're putting out magazines? No. I'm going to tell you what a magazine is so we all know and we all understand. A magazine is something that it's a carrier for advertising. That's all it is. It has a subject, but that subject only is in a portion, maybe one-tenth to one-fifth of that magazine. The rest of the, quote, magazine is advertising, front to back. Any magazine that you pick up, you count pages, four-fifths of it is advertising. The reason the magazine exists is because the advertisers want to be in a magazine about sexy girls or about famous people or whatever it is. And, in fact, if you tried to print a magazine that just had stuff in it like information, you couldn't do it. Why? Because you can't afford it. You print on good paper with all this glossy uh, 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 printing and, and all this. You can't afford it. It costs more to print it than it costs to sell it. The way you make money is with advertising. Well, the way you make money with comic books is by selling copies. There's advertising in it, but very often the advertising goes way down, and you're selling because you sell so many copies. That's how you make money, like a book. Okay? Well, that may be true, Mr. Adams, but we still feel our way, and we still feel that this is the way. I said, hold on. I understand, and you can say this till you're blue in the face, and you know what? I'll say you're right. It doesn't matter to me. Look, this is the question. The question is, let's just say an artist and a writer get together and they do a really good comic book. Now, let's just, I'm going to ask you, how many comic books do you have to sell for you to think or feel that you make money? Well, it could be any number. No, no, it can't be any number. You have what's called a break-even. You have to sell a given number of comic books for you to make a profit. How many do you have to sell? Because remember, we're printing on crap paper, and it's a very thin magazine. So how many? Well, it could be it could be uh, any number. Just pick your number. No, no, I don't have to pick a number. You're the publisher. I don't want the lawyers to be talking now. I'm just asking the publisher. How many copies are you going to say you're making money on? Is it going to be? Give me a number, 75,000 copies, 35,000 copies. You know what? Make up the number. I don't care what it is. Make up a number and tell me, what. well, if we, if we sold 75,000 copies, we'd certainly be making money. Okay, good. Let that be your number. You know it's not really your number, but let's pretend it's your number, okay? So if you sell 75,000 copies, you're making money, right? Yes, we make money. What if an artist and a writer got together and they did a comic book and they sold, help you sell, 500,000 copies? Do they deserve a royalty? Well, 500,000 copies, that's, that's, that's quite incredible. Well, sh- well sure, you know, you, I can see that they would deserve something. Then you just lost the argument. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Knock, knock. <laughs> There's a number change. beyond which you are willing to admit that they should get a royalty. Checkmate. Well, I gosh, well, well, then make that your number. Pick a number. Be dishonest with us. Lie to us. But pick a number and let us try to beat it. And when we do, give us a little tiny fucking piece of it, okay? (laughs) Well, I suppose we could do that. 
then what I'm am I doing nice. here? What am I doing wow. here, guys? <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Wow. You work it out. That's incredible. Uh, Brian, I think you, you, had, uh, you had a question for Mr. Adams. Being an artist in doing the art with the interior book working with a writer how much creative control do you have to change like if you wanted to change the look of something you could but screw the hell out of them you could <laughs> screw the hell out of them if you're if you're a dishonest person i mean i don't know any people who would do that i think that what you want to do is you want to work as a team and do a good job and uh, and come up with the best kind of product you can if you're you know if you're a jerk nobody wants to work with you they they hope that the writers hope and the publishers hope that you guys can work well together and they try out different teams uh... to work together i've always had a really great relationship with the people i work with um, uh, they may have quiet little criticisms but basically will tell you that uh, you know i've done a good job with their work and they were really happy but I mean, that's is not. That, why would you work on something that you're pissed off about, or you're not, you know, not trying to give it your hundred percent? If you got, a, you got, you got some kind of a, you know, bitch against the writer, or the writer's kind of bitch against you, you don't work together. Well, what if you wanted to change? You know, we'll say, we'll just take Batman for example, um, being one of the big characters that you worked on. Like, say, theoretically, uh, you wanted to change the look of his costume. Somewhat well, significant. how would that how would that involve the writer? <laughs> it wouldn't involve the writer. The writer, uh, look at uh, what you're asking me is about Batman, right? Uh, I mean, theoretically, yeah. I mean, any, any, any theoretically, character. fine. Any, any well, Hawkman, yeah. Uh, 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 Pat Boone comics. I'll, we'll talk about Pat Boone comics, okay? <laughs> New. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about Batman. Okay, so. Um, Batman uh, is not looking very good. Uh, he's drawn by Bob Kane, who is really essentially having people ghosted for him, and he's doing a crappy job. And Carmine is Carmine was doing it for a while, but then he begged off because he wanted to be an art director at DC Comics. So Batman was going down in sales because the TV show is no longer as popular as it was, and the comic book looks sort of like the TV show. It looked like a, it looked like Drek. Okay, so I know how to do Batman. I know what I what Batman ought to be. It's like what Jerry Robinson used to do, you know, that creature of the night, all the rest of that stuff. Only I could do it better. So I went to my editor, the editor of Batman. I said, you know, I'd like to do Batman. He said, get the hell out of my office. <laughs> Actually, he didn't say hell. <laughs> but anyway, so I went down to down the hall to uh, Brave, the editor of Brave and Bold, Murray Boltonoff, who I had done, uh, I think, uh, Jerry Lewis and Bob Hope comic books and added to his reputation. Anything I did for, for Murray was great, and he loved it. So he said, I like to do uh, Brave and Bold because that's Batman and Aquaman and Batman and Teen Titans, Batman and whatever. So uh, he said, sure. And he had Bob Haney doing it. Now, Bob Haney is a, was a terrific writer. Really, really terrific writer. If you read any of Bob Haney's Brave and Bold stuff, you got really dense stories, nice, long, fun stories, like Good Adventure. Every character he did, he researched. It was, it was terrific stuff. I'm not saying he was better than Denny O'Neill, but I would say I, I'd put him right next to Denny O'Neill as far as uh, sculpting a good story. Denny O'Neill had a particular bent, and I think people like that. Bob Haney, another kind of bent. He was, you know, one of the troops. Anyway, so Murray said, well, what, what do you want to do? In, a, in other words, do you want to rewrite the scripts? Or you want to, what do you want? I said, no, the scripts are great. I mean, it's terrific. But I would really like to take place at night, not in the daytime, because a guy going around in a bat costume in the daytime is going to attract some attention. I mean, what's probably about Yeah. <laughs> I said, you know, why isn't there a kid, you know, walking by pointing at him going, Mommy, that man's out there in his underwear. <laughs> he's walking down the street that's very weird so clearly uh that was a good it wasn't i was i didn't foist it upon anybody you know batman hangs around at night he also doesn't walk through the door <laughs> knock knock oh i'm batman's here can you announce me miss i'm here with I'm, your justice delivery uh, yes yeah, exactly <laughs> can, he should you know come through windows and out of closets and go boo and uh, scare people because he's got a you know dark costume on. Anyway, so Murray agreed that that was fine. I didn't. I don't think I changed the word of Bob Haney stuff. 
I just made it happen when it happened. I followed the script. I was I was a good boy. He did good scripts. And uh, but but then it became Batman. I mean, he was still writing Batman stories, but they were silly. Now he's writing Batman stories, and they looked very very right. Mm. And then of course, Julie Schwartz, who kicked me out of his office a half a dozen times, uh, invited me into his office and invited me to do Batman and. He gave me Denny O'Neill to work with, and Denny O'Neill had been a reporter. So Denny O'Neill is not what you call a clown uh, writer. He doesn't write for clowns. You know, he can do the Joker, I suppose, but essentially, you know, the Riddler and the Mad Hatter and all that other stuff, <laughs> not for Denny. Um, and so we started to write, you know, kind of uh, uh, scary stories about strange people, and and we had a good time. Then we did go into. Uh, into uh, the Joker, but we also went into Ra's al Ghul at the same time. We gave uh, Batman a Moriarty, for those of you who have followed the Sherlock Holmes thing. Right, right. And, uh, and uh, it's a great character. And so with that balance of, you know, Moriarty uh, on one end, the uh, clowns on the other end, and Joker in the middle, uh, I think we gave a good balance to Batman, and that's sort of being followed through in the movies. So, you know, the, there was no... I never had. I'm not a disagreeable type. Uh, if you're done, if you're doing something really, really, really stupid, I might come after your ass. But it has to be really, really stupid. You know, like tearing up pages and shit. Uh, if you're a good worker and you you and you got a good head on your shoulders and you know your skill and your craft, then I work with you and I'm, I have a great time. I'm one of those guys. I'm one. Of, I'm a. You know, uh, I dig the ditches along ne- next to the other guy. Wow. So I I have a question then with, sure. with you being with you being as obviously as seasoned as you are in the comic book industry doing so many characters working for both of the big two do you have any words of wisdom or advice for anybody out there that is aspiring to you know maybe be a writer or maybe be an artist or a publisher or, or sure. anything like that? <laughs> Sure. I, I mean, I have, I have lots of advice. I mean, it's a book full of stuff, but uh, you sort of have to be more specific. Do good work. Uh, do, 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 good work. <laughs> do good work. Be good at what you do. <laughs> work hard. Uh, put in uh, your best efforts. Try to work with people. Be nice. Uh, yeah, that's kind of general advice. Uh, you'd kind of have to be more specific. Okay, so it, Do I have the magic pellet? Yes, I have ma- several magic pellets, but you have to ask the right question. I see, I see. And there like if you're going to write, it's a pretty good idea to study writing in school. <laughs> Take classes, you know, learn to read and write and really put your effort into it. Learn what a good story is. We'll learn what a good plot is. Understand the concepts of beginnings, middles, and ends. Uh, break the rules, but only after you learn the rules. Uh, little things like that for writing. For art, uh, work from photographs. Work from photographs? Trace, trace photographs. Do I have an artist in there? Do I have an artist back there who's studying art? Oh, no. Not, no, no, no. no, no, no. I, can't, I can't draw a lick of anything. Yeah. Who, who's, the artist the, who's the artist among you guys? I could draw good stick figures. <laughs> trace photographs. Trace photographs. All the things that fans don't want you to do. The, who the hell listens to fans? Are you kidding? <laughs> Slap them around if you can. You know the 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 problem the problem with fans is that fans think they know you know where the where the pot of gold is and they never do it. Let me just tell you something that probably you don't want to hear, but in fact I'll I'll Play tell honest. it to you. All the greatest artists of the last hundred years, all the best artists of the last hundred years, trace photographs. All. All the best artists of the last hundred years. And the only reason I say a hundred years is because that's when they invented the camera. <laughs> Before that, they worked for models who they made to stand uh, for five hours so they could draw them and pose. In fact, one of the reasons why art sucks, old art sucks so much and so badly, is because we didn't have cameras and we didn't have models that could to take you could take pictures of what we had were models that could stand still so you're going to go well all right, that's really not true and neil adams is saying this shit but it's really not true but oh no it is true okay 
The only artist that could really draw interesting stuff was guys who drew, in effect, cartoons. They made it up out of their minds, their imagination. But artists that were really good, like uh, Rembrandt Van Rijn, uh, Michelangelo, uh, people like that, work from what we call models. Okay? The problem with working from models before cameras is that models could only stand still in a given pose for five hours or so, or they'd have to take breaks. So now you got Michelangelo, okay? So we'll all agree that Michelangelo, fantastic sculptor, right. okay? Good artist. Not a great, not a great artist, actually. kind of sucked. <laughs> well, he sucked because we have binocular vision, and he's used to seeing things in three dimensions. So when he sees things and he paints them, everybody gets fat. So all his paintings are kind of chunky people. Uh, anyway, so if you go look at it, you'll see. You go, oh, kind of chunky. Adam's kind of chunky there, so is God. I wonder why. Because he's got binocular vision and he's used to sculpting, not used to painting. Anyway, that's really unimportant. This is your class, folks. Pay attention. <laughs> Pay attention. Okay, so binocular vision. Look it up. Okay. So uh, he, he sculpted, okay, he sculpted Moses. You may have remembered seeing Moses, statue of Moses, okay, sitting in his chair, with his hands on the arms of the chair and his feet flat on the ground. Okay. Why? Because some poor bastard had to pose like that for five <laughs> hours and then take a drink and then pose like that again for five hours because this guy's chipping away at a piece of marble. So he's not going to be doing dancing, you know. He's not going to be on one foot with his other foot on top of a wall. So he's going to sit. David, the statue of David, okay, one knee bent, one leg straight. Why? Because that's the best way to stand for five hours. <laughs> you understand? All those statues that you that you have seen historically are. Let me see. What's the technical term? Boring. <laughs> Boring. They just stand there and just uh Please, you know, dance around for God's sake. Until you had cartoonists like Heinrich Klei, who had. Uh, hippos dancing with alligators who could actually almost draw realistically. The cartoonists could actually draw things in motion, but the really, really good artists, Rembrandt, for example, Rembrandt, I mean, you don't know this, okay, when I'm telling you something you don't know, but Rembrandt traced the people that he painted, okay? He had what's called a camera obscura, okay? What's and he mean? would project their images onto his canvas and he would trace them off and he would paint them. Okay, now uh, Rembrandt, okay, because he was who he is, created this thing. You, if you've taken any art classes, and God forbid you did, you might actually learn <laughs> something. But let's just say you did. You learned that Rembrandt van Rijn created this concept called um, chiaroscuro. You know, chiaroscuro. Ever hear of that? No. Uh -uh. Okay. No. All right. All right. Fine. You don't have to hear about it. It's oh. called, it, the translation is light out of darkness, light out of darkness. So if you look at Rembrandt's stuff, you'll notice that you have a character posed in a very interesting pose, beautiful, beautiful detail, metal with highlights and all kinds of stuff like Frazetta. Relating to you now, guys, okay, okay, beautiful stuff, but the background faded into darkness. Why? Because to light this guy, he had to put, all these candles around him and lamps around him so he would be lit enough that he could put him, reflect him through his camera obscura with the lenses and have him appear on the canvas behind him. But if he tried to light the whole room, he'd burn the castle down. Wow. <laughs> Understand? Uh -huh. Same thing with Vermeer. All these paintings of women by casement windows casement window after casement window and once you got past the light hitting the casement window the art turned to shit and that's one of the reasons why he never showed it to people because he used the camera obscura and he didn't want to admit that he's not a very good artist anyway <laughs> limitations of oh, technology uh, anyway the point is the point is that when we finally got cameras we could take pictures of people in a pose that they could have they could be in that pose for half a minute bing you got a photo now we go into commercial art, the commercial art world, which everybody has no respect for. We have respect for fine art, which is total crap, 
but we have commercial art where you have movie posters and paintings and magazines by uh, Norman Rockwell, fantastic artist of a whole, practically a whole century. Al Parker, uh, Bob Peake, uh, uh, Bernie Fuchs, Austin Briggs, uh, Drew Struzan, one of the most recent best artists around, all working from photographs. All working from photographs. Why? Because not only are you able to do a good illustration with photographs, but you're able to learn while you do it. Because there's nothing in your head. <laughs> if you had a choice of what you're going to use to do your illustration work, and the choice is between the crap that's in your head and the whole world around you, what choice would you make? Yeah, Certainly not the crap that's in your right, head. Right. You use the world that's around you because the world around you is what you're illustrating. So you have to go to that and use it. Or you have cartoonists who don't do cartooning, and even they have to go to the world around them. So mo what you have is you have all these art students and people who have opinions saying, well, a real artist doesn't trace. And you kind of go, mm, no. Try to listen to this schmuck, okay? <laughs> oh, all the best artists of the last hundred years trace photographs. Hello? Contradictory to what you're saying. All the best artists of the last hundred years trace photographs. Even, art, even comic book guys. The better they are, the more they trace photographs. So you said and like... So, huh? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You were saying before that, uh, you know, like old comic art, you know, can suck sometimes, you know, because you didn't have, uh, you know, uh, things to draw from. Um, like, as That's really, I mean, I, I, people did have things to draw from. Well, but and I, everyone, I, and all those artists also went to art school. They just as, aren't very good. As comic art has evolved over the years, I mean, like technologies are you know, a lot more advanced now than they used to be. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously a very different, you know, uh, style between, you know, comics from the 60s versus comics from today, you know, I mean, like, it, it's being part of that, you know, entire history, what, at what point, like, what, did it always, um, you know, like, how, how did you view it as an art form? Was it, was it always, um, you know, uh, okay, okay, you guys are ready, are you guys ready for this? We are ready. Are you, guys, are you guys ready for this? Okay, now you're going to hit with, hit with the heavy, the heavy shit. Let's okay? go for it. Okay. Comic books are the ideal art form. Artists get to tell stories with pictures and words. In the last generation, in the last several generations, they got to decorate the fronts of books and magazines. They got to illustrate certain stories but with, by which they could take a segment, a little piece, and illustrate that. But they didn't get to illustrate the whole story. Because something happened in the history of mankind, I'm going to tell you what it is. When men lived in caves, people who could draw would draw little comic books on the walls of caves. And the words, which were not words, were said by people in those caves because they would then describe why this drawing is here and what it represents and who that guy with the broken leg is and how the antelope came down and they did this. These were our first comic books, okay? As we came out of the caves and we started to have civilizations, well, you had to work really hard to have a civilization, so we would decorate pottery and all kinds of stuff like that. But when people started to build houses, there weren't paintings on walls. Paintings on walls is a modern affectation. They would paint the wall, okay? In a room, they would paint, if you go to Pompeii and you look at the illustrations in Pompeii, from Pompeii, the wall was painted. It's that illustration of your favorite god having fun with his goddesses or all the rest of it. They would have tiles on the floor, and the tiles would depict certain things within your society and your religion, and that would be part of your home. That art, that stuff, that storytelling art, okay, which was, it was always storytelling. It wasn't there just to be there. All that stuff told stories in your home. So when people came into your home, they'd know what you believed. They'd know what you respect. They'd understand where you come from because their home is a little different than your home. So they could see those things. And those things were not on the walls. Those were the walls, okay, and the floor. 
That was all part of your home. In Egypt and Mesopotamia, they had they started to have pictograms. Okay, pictograms are not what you think they are. Okay, if you were to look at Egyptian pictograms and you were told something about it, you go, well, and so would say, well, this over here, all these little ones. Okay, this is writing. Yes, it looks like little sculptures or it looks like little drawings, but this is writing. And then when you come to this big piece over here. This is the guy who owns this house and his two wives, and they're smaller, and then his slaves and his urns and his cattle and this stuff. This represents him. Okay, this is a picture. Those things leading up to it are dialogue and captions. That's the writing. This wall is a comic strip, just like you read today. Wow. wow. Same with Mesopotamia. Those things were not pictograms to them, to the people who read them. You could walk down a wall and go, oh, this is blah, 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 and here he is, a comic strip. They told stories. You would never think to look at them that way. No, you don't, but now you're going to. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now I want to be an archaeologist. Now, what's happened since then is, well, we had Christianity. Christianity came along and said and got rid of uh, the uh, the bad guys, which were the Mithrites. The Mithrites, the Mithrite religion, uh, was a very advanced religion. It came from Persia. Uh, it was a, uh, it was a, one of the scholars of the Mithrite religion was Zoroaster. They brought this Mithraic tradition into the Western world through the Roman soldiers, and you had Mithraeums all over the world, and you had uh, people were you had doctors and you had witches people. Christians later called them witches, but they were herbal medicine doctors. You had people who could read, who could write, and then Christianity, uh, I'm sorry, Christians, I'm really sorry to be saying this, came in and said, no, guess what? We're going to decide between Mithraism and Christianity. Christianity is for the poor people, and Mithraism is for the rich and upper class, and guess what? We're going to kick their asses. And they did. And so they destroyed Mithraism, but they also destroyed education along the way, and herbal medicine, and doctors, and people who were educated. They would scrape uh, mathematicians to, de to death with clamshells uh, all over the civilized world. They would do terrible, terrible things. And the Christians, uh, the people who were in charge, actually encouraged the idea that the regular people shouldn't read. So even if the stuff is in Latin or Greek, guess what? You don't get to read it. Only we get to read it. So we had 10,000 years of dark ages. We actually had to rediscover our culture during the Renaissance. People would finally go to um, the southern climes down to Italy and places and discover architecture and aqueducts. We were living in castles that were no better than caves. Western man was gorillas in the mist. And they did nothing. They learned nothing. And what would happen is if you actually became a, king, a kingdom that could really sponsor yourself and you had children that you wanted to have educated, let me see, where would you send them to be educated? You would send them to the Arab countries because the Arab countries are the only places that had universities. Wow. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> That's wow. Shattering you would, our reality. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, would send them, you would send them to Baghdad, where there were universities or schools of learning. And you would send them there so they would come back educated. They understood the sciences and math and all the rest of the stuff. Because in our Western world, there was nothing. <laughs> in fact, we turned our Mithras into magicians. Yeah. They came wow. the West, the, the, uh, the, the Magi of the Zoroastrian religion, who, by the way, uh, said that Jesus was the Son of God, um, those magi were the priests of the Mithraic religion. And they became, within the Christian culture, magicians who practiced oh. magic. Huh. Wow. They were the priests of the Mithraic religion that came out of Persia. They were camp followers of the <laughs> Romans who were building a culture. Then, so then you would send your kids to university in, this, in, the, in the Arab countries, where the only place that had universities. Uh, 
in the Western world. That's why. And they would come back educated, but they would come back with scraps of educate of information about things like aqueducts and columns. Culture. Culture. The culture that has been destroyed by the barbarians and ignored by the Christians, they would bring it back. Not among the religious class, but among the merchant class. So the merchant class rediscovered culture. There had to become a merchant class that did shipping and all these other things. And they discovered, because they would send their kids like the kings to Turkey and places like that to become educated and bring this education back. Then we go down and we started to kill them off, you know, because that's what we do. <laughs> right, well, of course. Just fucking <laughs> blow their brains out. They got running and, water, kill them. But at the same time, we would see the culture that was destroyed and toilets and running water and shit like that. <laughs> that's <laughs> they reading and writing and arithmetic. And so the 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 um, modern our modern western world began began to be built up out of the scrap heap of what we destroyed wow. we said, look at this look at this why don't we do this then we could pay artists okay but we didn't pay artists to do what they did back in the old days who decorated homes and stuff like that we paid artists to do tapestries and we paid artists to do paintings on canvas to cover the hole in the wall. And they'd be paintings of us. And the reason you got them to do it is because those fucking castles were so damn drafty that you had to cover as much of them with cloth and canvas as you could. So painters were, hey, guess what? This guy will paint paintings, but he'll make them really big. And he'll cover a lot of the wall, so it'll cut down on the draft. And these guys over here will do tapestries, and we can hang them on the wall so this place won't be you know, hell in the winter, because it's too big and airy. So art became a form of decorating walls, not the wall itself, like Leonardo, but by putting canvases and tapestries over the wall on which art was, art was done, because that was the excuse. For function, but, they, but all that stuff would be portraits, people standing there. Boring, boring. It, you know, you're lucky that <laughs> you're lucky that uh, that the uh, what do you call it, the impressionists came along to actually paint stuff other than Something pictures else. of people. You know, this is, it was a, and and within that was there any communication where the communication used to exist? No, no communication. The communication happened with minstrel shows and plays and uh, you know entertainments. That was and books. Then we got writing. Then we got Gutenberg. We got the Gutenberg Bible. But with that, we got movable press, movable, movable type. Suddenly, publishing came separate and apart from art. Separate and apart from art. It's taken all of this time for our culture to come back together. And guess what we made? Comic, Comic books. books. Wow. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that was probably the best story i've ever heard in my life i'm not gonna lie to you right now. i learned so much and it felt so good at the same time <laughs> That's a first, so if, if we have so what time, you're saying if we have time i want to i want to get one last question in if that's okay sure. okay so as a man who if you've listened to the podcast this far you can tell and if you're a comic book fan in general you have done everything you've seen it all you've been there you not yet not it not yet not, not yet. yet i'm working on it <laughs> but you've been around so much such a vast experience uh range of experiences rather you know from drawing all these characters writing all these different characters seeing all these different uh industry changing events and and you know the growth of the comic book conventions and and everything from from one end of the spectrum to the other if you had to pick one memory that really stands out and shines what would that one memory be from your what one memory from your from your My God, legendary comic book career thus far? i'm doing it right now the i'm doing it right <laughs> the comic kidding? book nerd nation podcast you heard it there ladies and I'm gentlemen doing it right now <laughs> i just i'll, I'll get i'll, I'll I, I used to think that uh, Superman versus Muhammad Ali was the best comic oh, book ever great done. Great cover. Oh, okay. that's such an epic cover. Right. Okay. Now, it's Batman Odyssey. 
And I'm going to tell you something about Batman Odyssey, okay? Because I got I took a lot of hits on the internet, and I'm ah, like an idiot, like a, like an idiot. No, like an idiot. I listened to everybody around me, and they said, "No, no, ignore those guys. No, no, you can't ignore those guys because I, you know, I forget." That, you know, if somebody comes at me, I know how to handle them. I just let it go. And I shouldn't have let it go. It was a big mistake. Now, I'm going to tell you why it was a big mistake for me to do it. No, nah, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you why Batman Odyssey is important. Because Batman Odyssey is a comic book, not a comic leaflet. Batman Odyssey is a comic book. It has all the things in it, that, and it's an odyssey. I didn't say Batman Odyssey because, oh, I just felt like coming up with a title. It's an odyssey, okay? Like Ulysses is an odyssey. It's one of those things that you'll read, if you read it from beginning to end, that you'll get to the end and you go, fuck, i got to read this again. Because he has planted so much shit in here, I can't, I just like, there's too much. This is just overblown me. This is a book. Now, this is what we're going to be doing in the future, not collected stories, not graphic novels as in graphic novels as a form, but as a book that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, has adventures as you go through, and is a book. Because, why? Because our business is going to change and stay the same, which is basically the way everything works. It changes and it stays the same, just like records. Suddenly, records are back. Hey, guess what? Why did I throw my old record player out? Because I'm an idiot, because I didn't learn my own lesson. Don't throw it out because it's going to come back around. We are going to do comic pamphlets, and we're going to do comic books. Not graphic novels so much as comic books. You can call them graphic novels. This, Batman Odyssey, what you're going to remember if you read it from beginning to end, beginning to end, and you get to the end, everything that happened in 52 will wash away, and you'll remember that. Just like any good book, will make you do that. Superman versus Muhammad Ali did that. You did it, and unconsciously you read it, and you said, hey, it's really cool, it's really cool, isn't that cool? No, 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 no. It's not just cool. It represents a cultural sea change. A black man who is a real-life hero that the world loved, not necessarily Americans, a shitload of Americans didn't like Ali, but the rest of the world loved, loved him. Loved him. He was a hero. And I put him together, we put him together with Superman. I ended up writing that story, by the way. Danny couldn't do it. Then he had to do something else. So I got to do that, okay? And it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's a fantasy. But it's about a real person. Whether you like him or you don't like him, we made a difference there. And that difference is remembered by people, and it's important to people. The next step in that thing was to create John Stewart. Mm. Remember John Stewart? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know how we got John Stewart? No. <laughs> go on, tell us. Come on, don't don't hold <laughs> back now. <laughs> okay, so I go out to see Julie Schwartz. And I say, Julie. Okay. Um. Uh. I think we're gonna have an assistant to uh, Hal Jordan. Uh, we already have that. I said, no, no, I mean, if something, if something happens to Hal Jordan, we've got to have a, another guy. He says, we have that. We have a guy named Guy Gardner. I said, I'm sorry, Julie, I don't read the comic books. What What are you talking about? So we pull out a comic book and show, show me this guy, is, and he's a blonde, uh, white Anglo-Saxon uh, gym teacher in the Midwest. I said, okay, Julie, so play with me here, okay. This guy from another planet comes to Earth. He's got purple skin, which really doesn't matter. He's going to die, and so he's going to send his ring out. He's going to find out the bravest, most worthy guy on Earth. Okay, It passes by Bruce Wayne. It passes by Superman. It passes by all the heroes of the DC and Marvel Universe and finds a test pilot. Well, I know a lot about Chuck Yeager. Chuck Yeager's a test pilot. He's got balls of steel. And I can understand. I'm gonna, I would never be a test pilot. You could anything. You could put a gun to my head. I wouldn't do it. Okay. So I'll believe that a test pilot could be this guy over everybody else. Okay. I'm going to buy that. He says, "What are you driving at?" I said, "Well." So the ring goes out again, and it finds a, a backup, and it's going to find this white Anglo-Saxon Midwestern 
gym teacher? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Same rules. It doesn't make any sense. Julie says, what are you driving at? I said, well, okay, Julie, let's try it this way. You ever watch the Olympics? He says, I always watch the Olympics. Okay. How often do you see three white guys up there? Gold, silver, bronze. I say, I see a white guy, I see an Asian, I see a black guy, you know. But I rarely ever see three white guys. Maybe in archery. I see three white guys. Archery. I can buy that. He says, you want a black green lantern, don't you? <laughs> wow. I said, well, okay. I said, okay, so we're split, you know, the world is split into Asian, African, uh, white, Anglo. I just find it a little disturbing that, you know, uh, this gym teacher <laughs> is worthy of this high honor. I'm not, you know, if he was something else, you know, another test pilot maybe, but, then, you know, he says, well, what if we have an Asian uh, Green Lantern? I said, well, you know, Julie, <sighs> you don't have a really good record with Asians. So what are you talking about? I said, well, for the first, like, 10 years of Green Lantern, when Gil Kane was doing it, he had this guy with him all the time, uh, an Asian kid named Pie Face. Oh. <laughs> I, no, <laughs> Julie, about, yeah. I don't really think an Asian guy called Pie Face puts you in a good stead with all our Asian brothers out there. Somehow I think they probably resent it. Can't imagine why. Pie Face. Was stupid, Julie. Well, that's right. You know, that was just a nick. No, it wasn't a nickname, Julie. It was a racial slur. <laughs> Pie face. I'm sorry. Wow. So you want to have you want to have a black green lantern? Said, yeah, I think so. I think I'd like to have a black green lantern. I think it would be good. I think it'd be good for America and everybody. So you know, why don't we do that? If you want to have an Asian, want to fight for an Asian, fine. It'll make up for the pie face. He says, well, okay, you have to draw it. I said, Julie, not only do I have to draw it, I have to draw it because I'm the only artist in comic books that knows how to draw black people. That includes black artists because they don't know how to draw black people because they're so used to drawing white people with brown skin because wow. they've been trained that way. He says, okay, fine, you do it. So then he wrote a script, right? And he did. He followed my you know, direction. It was it was an educated black. It wasn't a a ghetto bum or a, an African, which we had done up to there. He was an educated black American guy who studied architecture, and happened to be in the sixties. He didn't have a job. It makes all the sense in the world to me. Didn't have a job. Sixties, no matter how educated a black guy is in America, not going to have a job easily. Okay, so I'll I'll go, I'll go with that. So the guy's name was Lincoln Washington. <laughs> Lincoln Washington. Named two white presidents. <laughs> I go. <Yeah. laughs> so I went to, it's so okay I went to, because Lincoln abolished slavery though. Yes, exactly. So I went to so I went to Denny and I said, Denny, Lincoln Washington. He says, Not me. Not me, Julie, that's Julie. I said, okay. So I went to Julie Schwartz's room. I closed the door because there's going to be some yelling. Okay. <laughs> so go, go over to Julie. Julie, Lincoln Washington. He says, what? I know guys with names like that. Julie, that is his slave name. I mean, if you want every African, Afro-American in the country to write you letters, call him Lincoln Washington. I won't do the comic book. But that is his slave name. Don't you understand? You couldn't insult them worse. That's like pie face. It's stupid. Well, you know, I, I, you know, there's lots of I know that's a slave name, Julie. God damn it, you dumbass! <laughs> and he, he says, "Well, what would you call him? What would you call him? I, I would call him a name. Just give him a name. Well, why? What would you call him? A name? Just a name? Pick a name out of the air. John Stewart. Now, how would I know he'd become a late night comedian?" <laughs> yeah. So you actually, you actually just randomly chose the name John Stewart. That's right. Oh, That's right. Just wow. like a good name. Heated conversation just pulled right. it, snatched John it Stewart. right out of the That's air, right. and now it sounds like a good story. name to me. Yeah. That's right. There you go, John Stewart. Oh. Okay, so ramifications. <laughs> two, two, two ramifications. Okay. One, of course, is 
when they announced the Green Lantern movie, and they went right, and we discovered that they went right from Gil Kane to uh, Jeff Johns and left, left out Neil and Denny, which I don't quite understand, uh-huh. and lost $150 million. When they announced it, they announced, you know, Hal Jordan, uh, uh, Green Lantern. Every kid in America went, who the hell is right. Hal Jordan? Because well, of the, all the, the cartoons. cartoons have been John yeah. Stewart throughout this whole like, time. Yeah. I don't know. Warners and DC Comics somehow thought that selling 70,000 copies was equal to having tens of millions of kids watching cartoons on Saturday and Sunday. Unbelievable. What kind of thinking makes that happen? I have no idea. Same kind Every of kid in America knew. It's okay to cut art up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Goddamn exactly, the suits. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, so that's. That, that, to me, is probably one of the funniest parts of the story, but I, I have another funny part of the story. Really stupid. So um, I colored the story, and, of course, I made uh, John Stewart skin brown because he's brown. So I made it brown, brown. Now, the tradition in comics was uh, there was a character called Jackie Johnson that Joe Kubert drew, and, and his skin was shit brown, what we call shit brown in comics. That is, it's solid yellow, 25% red, 25% blue, which is kind of khaki color. Some guys, some black guys have light skin, black guys have uh, that kind of color. It's, but in comics, we call it shit brown, because it's a color of khaki, right? Not really brown. Right. At Marvel, they had a guy, I believe his name was Gage, who was in the Howling Commandos. They colored him gray, <laughs> if you ever look it up. He's gray. <laughs> he's black, but he's gray. Right. I mean, what's his name? Like Kirby. somebody actually was born with the color of gray, like gray skin. skin. Right. right. I don't know what that is. So anyway, I had colored. I colored him brown. And when you do comics back back in those mm-hmm. days, you have to label the colors. You know, why R R three B two, which means uh, solid yellow, fifty percent red, twenty five percent blue. So he was a good, you know, rich brown. So <laughs> Julie Schwartz. <laughs> With Sal Harrison, head of production, came to visit me in my room where I'm hiding artists to introduce them to different editors at DC Comics who who were terrified to hire somebody new. So they'd be hiding in the corner, you know, Bernie Wrightson and people like that. And uh, they came to me and they said, uh, Neil, uh, you you, you colored this. I said, yeah. He said, "Uh, you colored colored, uh, John Stewart uh, like brown. Yeah, <laughs> like we're like really, like really, like, like really, like, right. like really brown. I mean, we usually don't, you know, color um, black people brown like that. It's, we use a lighter brown. I said, well, you've done it wrong. <laughs> so, so this is right. But, but, and listen to this. You got. I'm going to say it, and you're not going to believe it. But don't you think black people will be offended? <laughs> what? <laughs> you made <laughs> No, I, uh, no, I don't think. That, I think they've been offended for the past fifty years. Oh, wow. But I don't think they'll be offended by this. So they said. So Saul said, "Well, this is on you, Neil." <laughs> okay. Okay, I think I can take this one. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think there's going to be a problem here. I don't think we're going to have a problem. Sorry for accurately portraying their race. My right, bad. exactly. Wow. That's, that's so crazy. we move forward in time, you know, things change, and, uh, and you try to be there when the change happens. That's what I like. I like being there when the change happens and enabling the change. Then everybody else can pile in and go, hey, I just discovered this. No, you didn't. I didn't. Now, you it's a, you know in the same room as Neil Adams. That's all. Say that again. Yeah, it happened to me. It happened to me. <laughs> no, there, there's some people who do that, you know, and usually they're considered to be a pain in the ass. And I'm, you know, I can see that I'm, people might consider me kind of a pain in the ass to do this kind of shit. But you know, it moves things forward. There has to be somebody who does that. You know, stirs the pot a little bit, makes things happen. Well, I mean, without, in all honesty, without selling, sounding like a complete and total brown noser, which, I mean, we are obviously all fans of your work and everything you've done for the industry. Which is good. Realistically, I don't sound like that. <laughs> realistically, I mean, comic books would not be where they're at today without you being the catalyst for change that you were. You know, you somebody, has to, somebody has to do it, right? Right. It just happens to be me. 
I was in a better position, uh, in all honesty, in all honesty, I was in a better position to do it. I had independent income that I could, I could do advertising work. Um, I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> it's always, always a good idea to be somebody like that who's really not afraid. Uh, and I can, uh, uh, you know what? I'm a nice guy. I got a really nice smile. And I get along with people, and it's very hard to, you know, stay mad at me. <laughs> so, awesome. I work it. I work it. You know, when I was a, when I was a teenager, I was a barker on a carousel. I was in a ring stand on a carousel, and uh, I used to sell tickets to people who came by. And I never felt that I sold a ticket to somebody that didn't have a really good time when he got on the carousel. I don't think I ever made a change in comic books that didn't make comic books better and make people happier. Every artist uh, uh, that was out there that was afraid that Stanley might fire them or, you know, DC Comics might fire them if they insisted that they get their artwork back and they were terrified. And so they were, they were afraid that Neil would cause some, you know, mass firing of people in comics. In the end, when the artwork was returned, everybody doubled their income that year by being able to sell their artwork to fans. Yeah. It's it's a whole Great. it's a whole other industry essentially. Right, exactly, and that and that's what change that's what makes these sea changes in the world. Uh, and now when you're I doing can, it again with with yeah, progressing forward with Odyssey, like you said, but that's, into the new the new. But that's sort of my job, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I, somebody got to do it. Kudos, kudos to you for not being oh. uh, you know being satisfied with the status quo and and always pushing forward to. You know, press the envelope and. and but what? It, it, but what, what? What was the result of it? We have better comics. We have more better artists who have you know been through college and made choices to be in this industry exactly. rather than uh, other industries. So now the competition is fantastic. We're make they're making movies of of work that all these great artists are doing. We're moving into a future where where, where everybody thought you know. A year from now, that'll be the end of it. Now it's like comic books are taking over the world. There's 70 conventions in the United States alone in a year. There's only 52 weeks in a year. (laughs) By the end of the year, there's going to be 100. A hundred. There's six. There's six conventions in Australia. There's three conventions in England. I mean, it's just growing and growing, and 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 all that's happening. Look, we're not going to war. We're not killing people. We're creating interesting entertainment and and educating our people because comic books are not just you know this guy punches this guy we can do uh, the greek tragedies we can do there's books out there that are educational in nature and yet they're fun uh we can retell the wizard of oz we can do anything in comic books. we can do books on philosophy if we want to there's no end to what it is that we can do with this form we this this may be day one how many kids out there have have improved their reading skills just by reading, you know, the content? I know. I can. I can tell you. I can tell you. I did yeah, when I was I a absolutely kid. Absolutely did. I absolutely listen, did. As right. a child. Absolutely. When I was a kid. When I was a kid, you can trade stories with me. When I was a kid, I couldn't go to kindergarten because of my birthday was in June. Or I don't know what that had to do with it. So I had to go into first grade. So I went to first grade, and they gave us these these books called um, Dick and Jane, and you can see, and, and Spot, yeah, Dick yeah, and Jane yeah. and Spot, C-Spot run. and it's C-Spot Run, right? right, right C-Spot right, Run. Right. I'm re- reading these books, and I'm going, what the hell is wrong with these people? Can't they read? <laughs> 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 I'm trying to figure out what, what John Car- what Deja Thoris is saying to John Carter when she says, you spurn me? <laughs> spurn? Wait a second, it must mean something. I don't know what that is. got to look that up. Oh, wow. Spurn? You spurn me? Oh, you spurn. I thought it was something else. And like in the, the C spot run, I couldn't relate to it. How was it for you? Well, for me, for me personally, you know, I, uh, when I was younger, I had, uh, I had ADD, like the whole, like, I just couldn't stay focused on things very long. Uh-huh, it uh-huh. really captured my interest. And so for me, uh, you know, reading assignments and stuff in school are always like, whatever you know the school demands and whatever the teacher picks which oftentimes is you know good literature or whatever but at a young age it's kind of hard to get captivated by that and so it was essentially kind of a practice thing you know that that my my dad helped me out with like you know get one comic book and if you can read it cover to cover then next time we'll try to do two comic books right and so you know like kind of getting that you know 
you know, the, the practice, so to speak, of reading longer, reading more pages, reading to where, you know, to now, I, I love reading novels. I love reading comic books. I'll right, sit down exactly. and, and, and read for, you know. And that's, and that's part of the whole experience of comic books. Com- reading, should, reading should be fun. Education should be fun. It all should be fun and enjoyable because you learn more and you learn it better. I mean, there's this. This is we're in a medium that shows a pathway, and the pathway is a good, positive pathway, and it works. Guess what? It works. So you know, I'm gung ho for comic books. I just, uh, I just can't believe that uh, all this stuff happened in my lifetime so fully and so completely, and it's just marching forward. And this, as I said, is day one. Well, it's just, it's honestly, it's a tribute to all the hard work that you've put in and, and everything that you've uh, that you've dedicated to to the comic book industry. Well, they better do it, or else I'm going to punch them in the face. <laughs> punch them in the face. <laughs> punch them. Uh, I think we've uh, we've about ran out. I think we we don't want to take up too much. We've about run time. out. Run out of Watch time. It. Thank you. But uh, I, I I personally, and I'm sure all the rest of uh, the people here would agree with me. I truly, honestly appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your busy schedule to meet with us, talk a little bit, regale us with your tales of of justice and glory. And, uh, well, I hope you've had a good time. Oh, it's, it's been a been, pleasure, guys. Been, and uh, I hope you learned awesome. a couple of things along the way. Absolutely. Oh, I've learned quite a bit. Thank you so much. So. Okay. Take it easy. Uh, you too. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.